2.2 complex numbers. So I mentioned a little bit about complex numbers in the previous section from 2.1, but now let's go ahead and actually talk about them and define them. So before this section, we could never do the square root of a negative number. But the problem was that the square root of a negative number tends to show up often in very many other problems. So to get around this, mathematicians decided to go ahead and we created a new number. We call this the imaginary unit. We say that the imaginary unit, denoted by the letter i, is the number such that i squared is equal to negative 1. Or more commonly, you may see it as i is equal to the square root of negative 1. So again, Prior to this, we can never work with the square root of a negative numbers. And now we've defined what is the square root of a negative 1. So we have the imaginary unit. And now that we have the imaginary unit defined, let's talk about a complex number. A complex number is a number that has the form a plus bi. In other words, a number plus or minus a number times i where a and b are real. We say a is the real part of my complex number, while b is the imaginary part of my complex number. So for example, here I have 5 plus 9i. 5 is my real part, 9 is my imaginary part. So now that we've introduced complex numbers and imaginary numbers, I can finally talk about in all of those previous sections that we've worked with, I kept on saying A and B are real numbers. Well, now we have an example of a number that is not real. We call them complex or imaginary numbers. So how do we uh, deal with these imaginary numbers? Well, the first thing that we usually encounter um, imaginary numbers is when we're taking the square root of a negative number. So. To take the square root of a negative number, I'm going to recall a property about the square root. If a and b are real numbers that are not both negative, then I know that the square root of a times b is equal to the square root of a times the square root of b. So using that property, let's go ahead and look at these examples on example one. Simplify the following as much as possible. For part a, I have the square root of negative 9. If I want to use my square root property, I can write this as the square root of negative 1 times positive 9, which can further be broken down into the square root of negative 1 times the square root of positive 9. Well, we know what the square root of 9 is. The square root of 9, we definitely get 3. And the square root of negative 1, we've just defined that to be i. So, the square root of negative 9 is the free i. So this is using the property of the square roots. Or in other words, we can see any time I take the square root of a negative number, we almost treat it like it's a normal square root, but we throw an i on there. So uh, to really push this in, let's look at uh, part b. I have the square root of negative 18. Well, negative 18, unfortunately, is not a perfect square root. But I can break it down. I could write the square root of negative 18 as the square root of, for example, uh, let's say 2 times negative 9. Using my square root property, I can write this as the square root of 2 times the square root of negative 9. Let's see. The square root of 2, that doesn't clean up. And 2 is as simplified as possible. So I'm going to leave that alone. However, the square root of negative 9, we know the square root of 9 is 3. And since it's a negative, there's an i on there. 
And just for a standard, I'm just going to go ahead and leave my I at the very end of my uh, answer. So the square root of negative 18, I get 3 square roots of 2 times I. Make sure you don't put the I inside of the square root, by the way. It has to be outside of my square root. And then for my last part of example one, part C, I have the square root of negative 17. A negative square root of negative 17, uh, excuse me. Well, if I wanna clean this up, I should first clean up the square root of negative 17. The negative on the outside still stays the same. Since I know I'm taking the square root of a negative number, there must be an I involved in my final answer. And now all I'm asking is, what's the square root of 17? Well, the square root of 17. 17 does not clean up at all. It doesn't break down into smaller factors. The only way you make 17 is 17 times 1. So there's nothing I can really do there. Hence, I may leave it as negative square root of 17 and once again, my I must be on the outside of my square root. So my final answer again is negative square roots of 17, I. So we did some examples where I took the square root of negative numbers. We are introducing I into our world. Well, now that we've introduced a new number, I should be able to do common operations on that new number. In other words, I should be able to do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division on that new, new number. So we're gonna talk about some properties of these complex slash imaginary numbers. The first one is equality between complex numbers. Two complex numbers are equal if and only if the real parts are equal to each other and the imaginary parts are equal to each other. And for the operations, the sum and difference of complex numbers, here it's gonna look like it's very convoluted and very a lot of letters, but this is just our formal way of saying we're just combining our like terms. I don't recommend that you try to memorize this formula because it's actually gonna be very intuitive about how we work this out. So let's get some practice with addition and subtraction. Example two, simplify the following. Part A, three minus i plus five minus i. So to perform this operation of addition, I am simply combining my like terms. If I want, I can also write this as three minus i plus five minus i. From here, all I had to do is combine my like terms. In other words, I combine my numbers with the numbers and my i's with the i's. So here I have 3 plus 5, so 3 plus 5, giving me positive 8. And then negative i minus i. Well, negative 1 minus 1, I get negative 2i. I have my final answer. Once again, all I'm doing is combining my like terms, and I'm being careful about my negatives and positives. Make sure you don't accidentally get them mixed up. Now let's look at part B. I have 3i minus 2 minus i minus 5. So whenever I'm dealing with subtraction, I do have to be a little bit more careful. I could write this as 3i minus 2 not much changed. But for this second portion, remember it's minus the entire parentheses. In other words, I am minus i and minus negative five. Well, minus i, I get minus i. Minus negative five, I get positive five. So I have three i minus two minus i plus five. Now, I just combine my like terms. And once again, I like starting off with the numbers and then finishing with my i's. So for my number in, I got negative two plus five. Negative two plus five, I get three. 
Now for my i's, I have 3i minus i. In other words, 3 minus 1 giving me plus 2i, giving me my final answer. Again, make sure you're very careful about that negative in the middle. But outside of that, we are simply adding or subtracting as needed. Now, we'll just do part C for some extra practice. I've got i minus, in parentheses, i minus 2. Once again, I'm doing subtraction, so I need to be mindful. I'm going to go ahead and distribute my negative to both terms, giving me i minus i, and then minus negative 2, or in other words, plus 2. And now I just clean it up a little. Again, I like putting my numbers first. So my only number here turns out to be a 2. And then i minus i, that's 1 minus 1 i, or just 0 i. If you want to put it down for notes, you can put plus 0 i, which just cleans up to be a positive 2. So we're done with example C. So we have some practice now with adding and subtracting imaginary slash complex numbers. Let's talk about the product of complex numbers. So here I have the formal definition of multiplication. You might get a little intimidated by all these letters flying around. But the long story short is actually all we're doing is we're just multiplying two binomials. So if you're familiar with the old FOIL rule, first times first, outside, time to outside, insides, and last times last. That's all we're doing here. So I can see here in this example, uh, well not example, um, this little formula, I have a binomial times a binomial. All I have here is just A times C, and BI times DI is going to end up giving me this expression here. And then for the other ones, we can tell that we're going to get this over here. So you'll see a little bit more about what I mean whenever we go through these examples. So let's go ahead and look at example 3, part A. I want you to go ahead and do this multiplication and simplify as needed. So here I have 2i times i plus 7. So here I got a single term times a binomial. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this single term and distribute, that is multiply to each individual one inside of my parentheses. So 2i times i, I get 2i squared plus 7 times 2i, I get 14i. So I did my multiplication and here's where things start to get a little different than what we did for addition and subtraction. Remember, at the way beginning, we introduced the definition of the imaginary unit. We said we defined it to be i squared is equal to negative 1, or equivalently, i is equal to the square root of negative 1. So here, notice I got an i squared term. So I can simplify this even further. We said i squared is the same thing as negative 1. So I can write this as 2 times negative 1 plus 14i. Well, if I clean this up, I get negative 2 plus 14i. So I have my final answer. I can say that this is my final answer because it's in a plus bi form. In this case, my a is negative 2 and my b is positive 14. So we're doing a comparison. Usually, when possible, we like to put it in this a plus bi form. So for example, 3a, I had a single term times a binomial, and we just multiplied as needed. The biggest consideration was remembering that i squared is, in fact, negative 1, by definition. Let's go ahead and look at part b now. Now I got 3 minus i times 6 minus 4i. I got a binomial times a binomial. So I'm going to multiply, and if you're more comfortable with the phrase foiling, we're going to multiply this out through our FOIL method. 
That is the first times first. So three times six, giving me 18. The outsides, three times negative four i, giving me minus 12 i. The insides, negative i times six, I get minus six i. And then the last times the last, negative i times negative four i. Let's see, we get a positive 4i squared. And now I have to clean this up. I don't want my answer to have any i squares or anything like that. And I'm also going to go ahead and combine any like terms that I see fit. So I have 18. I can look at this and say, well, in the middle, I got two like terms. Both of these are i to the 1 power. So I can combine them. So I got negative 12 minus 6i, giving me minus 18i. And just like before, whenever I look at this last term, there's an i squared. Well, i squared is the same thing as negative 1. So I have 4 times negative 1, or simply I can write this as minus 4. And once again, I combine my like terms. Here I can do 18 minus 4 giving me 14 minus 18i. So I got my final answer. This matches my a plus bi form. In this case, a is 14 and b is negative 18. So that finishes our example part b. Now just for practice, I have this part c. 4 minus i squared. Well, one thing to be careful about, one thing that we don't want to do, again, something that we don't want to do, is that this isn't just 4 squared minus i squared. That's not what we want. Remember, whenever we write this squared notation, it's the whole parentheses squared, meaning really what I want is 4 minus i times 4 minus i. So now I can see that I'm just multiplying my two binomials. These happen to be the same thing. Go ahead and take a couple of minutes, maybe pause the video, see if you can do the multiplication and simplification here. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and multiply this out. Again, if I multiply my first times first, outsides, insides, and last, I should get, in this particular order, I get 16 minus 4i minus 4i, and then plus i squared. So cleaning this up, I have 16. Negative 4i minus 4i gives me minus 8i. And then i squared, again, we said that this was negative 1. So we have a minus 1 here. And then I combine my like terms again. I get 16 minus 1, or just 15 minus 8i as my final answer. Again, the key part that we're doing here is making sure that we multiply everything properly, and that I remember that i squared is the same thing as negative 1. So that finishes our example 3 on uh, multiplication. Now we can start moving on to our last operation. We had addition and we had subtraction. I've got multiplication, so I should also be able to do division, or more formally, the quotient of a complex number. And just like the multiplication, here I got the very formal definition and formula on how we simplify a complex number. But we're going to talk about this through our example. One thing I want to point out, uh, one definition I want to point out, is this thing called the conjugate. Well, a conjugate of a binomial is whenever everything looks almost the same, but my sign in the middle is swapped. So you can see here in my little formula, if I have a plus bi and c plus di, if I want to simplify this, what I have to do is look at my denominator, in this case c plus di, and I'm going to multiply by the conjugate. 
C minus DI. So you can see originally I had plus DI. I multiplied by the same thing, but now it's minus DI on the top and the bottom. Again, I'm allowed to do this because in the end, this whole thing right here that I'm boxing, this is just equal to one. Anything divided by itself uh, that's not zero, we get that it's equal to one. The reason that we do this is that you're gonna see that it actually helps us get rid of this I on the bottom that was in the original problem. So this is gonna be our process for completing the quotient of a complex number. One thing I want to note is, why do we need to get rid of the i on the bottom? Well, remember, i is defined to be the square root of negative 1. If I leave an i in the bottom, my denominator, that means I have a square root on the bottom of my expression. And if you are from previous math classes, you probably encountered the thing where we don't want a square root on the bottom typically. We typically have to rationalize. So this is our idea of rationalizing with the letter, the number i. So let's go ahead and look at these two examples in example four. Again, I want you to simplify these expressions. I've got 3i plus 2 over i minus 1 for part a. Again, all I'm going to do here is I'm going to look at my denominator. In this case, i minus 1. I'm going to multiply by the conjugate of my denominator, meaning here I had i minus 1. I'm going to swap it over to be i plus 1 over i plus 1. Remember, I have to do it on the top and the bottom. So after I do this, I'm just going to multiply straight across. I have 3i plus 2 times i plus 1. And on the bottom, I got i minus 1 and i plus 1. So this is why we did multiplication first as well. Because again, my quotient, I had to multiply by the conjugate. So on the top, I'm going to multiply this out. So the first times the first, I get 3i squared. The outsides, 3i times 1, I get plus 3i. The insides, I should get 2i. And for the last, I should get plus 2. All divided by on the bottom, i times i, I got i squared. The outsides, plus 1i. The insides, minus 1i. And the last, minus 1. So my job is to continue cleaning this up until I have that nice a plus bi form. We're going to use all the same rules that we had before. On the top, then my numerator, 3i squared. Once again, we know i squared, that's equal to negative 1. So my 3i squared, that's the same thing as negative 3. Next, I have 3i plus 2i. That becomes 5i, positive 5i, plus 2. And then on my denominator, i squared, i squared we know is negative 1. We have plus 1i minus 1i. Plus 1i minus 1i, that becomes 0i. So I'm not going to write plus 0. And then I still have a minus 1 down here at the end. Continuing to clean this up, on the top I can combine my like terms. Negative 3 plus 2, I got negative 1 plus 5i. All over negative 2. So notice I don't have any more i's on the bottom. This is not a coincidence. By multiplying by the conjugate, I can guarantee that my i's and my den denominator are going to go away. But I'm not done just yet. Remember, I want my final answer to be in the form a plus bi, a number plus or minus a number times i. Right now in my current form, negative 1 plus 5i all divided by negative 2. That doesn't match the form I want. I want it, again, to be a number plus or minus a number times i. Right now it looks like I have a plus bi divided by 2. Well, to get around this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead, let me write here on the left, I'm going to go ahead and split up 
my expression into two parts, meaning I'm going to write negative 1 over negative 2 plus 5i over negative 2. Now, if I clean this up, negative 1 over negative 2, I get positive 1 half. 5 divided by negative 2, I get 5 half i. This definitely lo looks like my a plus bi form. In this case, a is 1 half, and b is negative 5 over 2. Again, I know I'm not finished until I have the a plus bi form. So that finishes our example part 4a. Now for practice, go ahead and see if you can finish part b. Part b says we have 4i divided by 2 plus i. Alright, so looking at part b, I'm going to follow the same idea. I'm going to go ahead and look at my denominator, and we're going to multiply by the conjugate of my denominator. So my, uh, my original was 2 plus i, so I'm going to multiply by 2 minus i over 2 minus i. If I go ahead and multiply by these, on the top I just have to distribute my 4i. That is, I multiply 4i times 2, and then 4i times negative i. If I do that, I get 8i minus 4i squared, all divided by, whenever I multiply my conjugate on the bottom, I get 4 uh, minus 2i plus 2i minus i squared. So now my job is to clean everything up as needed. 8i can stay by itself on top because there's no like terms. Negative 4i squared. Well, again, i squared is negative 1. So I have negative 4 times negative 1, or just plus 4. Now I can go ahead and clean up my denominator. I can notice that in the middle, I have plus 2i and minus 2i, which are going to cancel each other out. And again, this is something that I'm expecting to happen each time I multiply by the conjugate, leaving me with 4 minus, well, i squared is negative 1, so I have 4 minus negative 1. Continuing on my uh, cleaning spree, I have 8i eight plus, eight plus 4 on top, and on the bottom, 4 minus negative 1, minus negative 1 becomes a plus 1, so I got 4 plus 1, or 5. And now, just like before, this isn't a final answer for me. I want that a plus bi form. I want it to be separated. So I want to put my number first, in this case 4 over 5 plus 8i over 5, giving me my final answer in a plus bi form. So we're done with example 4, and now we know how to divide by a complex number. With that, we can do all of the operations, the four basic ones, with a complex number. Now I want to refer back to what I said at the beginning of today's lecture, and what I said at the end of section 2.1. Last time in 2.1, we encountered a quadratic equation where I eventually ended up with the square root of a negative value. Well, now that we know how to deal with the square root of a negative value, I can actually do problems like those. So let's go ahead and look at example five, our last example for today. As I said, now that we can deal with the square root of a negative number, I no longer have to put no solution. I can actually give you a full solution. So here, for example 5, I want to solve for x given the quadratic equation 2x squared minus 2x plus 5 is equal to 0. So remember, to solve a quadratic equation, I want to make sure I'm in standard form, which, if you recall, is ax squared plus bx 
plus c is equal to zero. Well, if I look and compare this to my standard form, I know my current equation is already in standard form. Now I can identify what's my a, b, and c. In this case, a is my number in front of x squared, b is my number in front of the x, and c is my plain number. So I have 2, negative 2, and 5. Now I can use my quadratic formula. Just as a reminder, I'm going to go ahead and write it again. Quadratic formula states that if I have a quadratic equation in standard form, then x is negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c all over 2 times a. So I'm just filling in the blanks from a, b, and c. So I have negative b, so negative, negative 2, plus or minus the square root of b squared. Again, I'm using a parenthesis to be really careful about my negative sign. Minus 4 times a times c, all over 2 times a. Now my job is to clean this up and hopefully we get a decent looking answer. So from the beginning, negative negative 2, that becomes a positive 2, plus or minus the square root. Negative 2 squared, I get 4. Make sure you're not getting negative 4. And then negative 4 times 2 times 5, we get negative 8 times 5, or just 40, negative 40 in particular, all over 4. Continuing on this track, I got 2 plus or minus the square root. Let's see, 4 minus 40, I get negative 36. Again, all over 4. My 4 isn't changing that much so far. So, now that I have the square root of negative 36, we know that the square root of 36 is actually 6. And since it's a negative 36, I should put an i on there. So now I have 2 plus or minus 6i over 4. Well, we're almost there at the final answer. Once again, I want to make sure that I have two separate portions. So I'm going to split my fraction into two parts and then simplify as needed. Let's see, 2 over 4, that reduces down to 1 half, plus or minus 6 over 4. I can reduce that down to 3 over 2i, giving me my final answer that has an i in my expression. So now we know how to deal with all types of quadratic equations, even if they have an imaginary, or more accurately, a complex number answer. All right, so now we know how to deal with our complex numbers and how to work with any quadratic equation. That's all we have for today.